takes me to his heart of sun. He asks me not to fill a servant's place. The far off country wanderings all are done. Wide open are his arms of grace. Such love, such wondrous love. Such love, such wondrous love. That God should love a sinner such as I. How wonderful is love like this one more time. Such love, such wondrous love. Such love, such wondrous love. That God should love sinners such as I. How wonderful is love like this. Amen. Such love. Amen. Did 
shall be given unto you. happy to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Isn't this a wonderful place to be? It's cold outside, it's spitting rain, so for that reason it's a good, good place to be. But aren't you happy to be in the house of God with people of like precious faith, able to listen to the word, to worship God in spirit and in truth? That is something that we should not take for granted. Isn't that wonderful? Praise the Lord. My, it's good to be with you. Look around, see so many different friends. It's just a, a pleasure to be with you. Very thankful that Brother Chad invited me to be here with you today. It's an honor, and it's a real privilege to be among you. Amen. Well, if you would, I'd like to invite you to take your Bibles with me. Thank you, musicians. Enjoyed the, uh, the music and the singing. Brother Nathan enjoyed that special. Wish I was going to be here next weekend to hear you, but uh, we'll be praying for you. I'd like to invite you to turn with me, if you would, to the book of Galatians, and I'd like to read in chapter 6, Galatians, the sixth chapter. And uh, it was also good to be with um, um, the Lamb family yesterday as they celebrate the, uh, the marriage of, um, of two wonderful young individuals. And... Uh, to witness the marriage of a lamb, not the lamb. That was, uh, you knew that joke was coming, but uh, it still cracked me up a little bit. I enjoyed being with them. You know, I think Brother Branham said the, the best gift that God could give a man outside of his salvation right. is a wife, a good wife. And that's the truth. That's nothing but the truth. Um, a good portion of who I am today is because of my wife. And, um, and all that God has, has brought us through and brought us together for. But you know, marriage takes work. It's not an easy thing. You old timers can uh, tell me of that much more easily than I could at this point in my life. Um, but there's nothing, there's nothing better Amen. than having someone who loves you and that you love. You dwell together. You, you learn things together. You learn about each other. You grow. You change together. Change is inevitable. It's the only thing that is constant. And you change together. It's a beautiful thing. It's crazy to think that you could take two humans from two separate families, merge them together, and they get along, and then they create more humans who do the same thing. It's a fabulous institution. <laughs> but uh, 
It works. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Galatians, the sixth chapter. I'd like to read verse 14 with you. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Let's pray if you'd bow your heads. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for all the many things that you have given to us. Thank you for your blessings. And may we count every blessing, which are many. Lord, we thank you for the truth as we pursue it the best we can. Lord, by your grace today, may we seize everything that you have for us. May you encourage, may you lift up, may you instruct, may you remind. Lord, we pray that you'd afflict the comfortable, comfort the afflicted. We surrender ourselves entirely into your hands. We love you so much. We say thank you. Bless these few moments that we have together. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. You can have your seats. Thank you for standing with me. I was uh, reading this week, and, and the life and the ministry of the Apostle Paul has always been of great interest and a wonder to me. If I could write a book, no one would read it, but if I could write a book, I would write it on the life of Paul, um, as, as, it, as it should uh, uh, be a wonder to every Christian, the life of Paul. From what I can tell, the uh, a little over half of the New Testament is attributed to Paul, more than half of the, of the New Testament is attributed to Paul. And then even when we look at the book of Acts about his life, it, the book of Acts is largely about his life. And uh, the Pauline epistles that have been called in the, in the, uh, on to the book of Acts with the, with the uh, anointing of a lion, he charges into the, the world with the message of the gospel he gives the church the knowledge of their first love. He, he, he was the one that, that, that spread it around and they caught a hold of the vision and they, they grasped the message of the hour. And he was the one that led that charge in, into a world that knew hardly anything of Christ. They knew nothing of Christianity. And he presented that to the first church. I admire uh, the experiences that he went through in his life. I, I admire, uh, most importantly, as I was just remarking, his obedience to the scriptures, and uh, of which he was a great scholar and a well-studied man of the truth and of the, of the, of the Torah, of the Bible, as well as um, uh, uh, within the Sanhedrin and, and all of the inner, inner workings of the temple. He was well-studied. He was a scholar of the scripture. and so. Later in his life, as he began to serve Christ, he submitted in obedience to the word which he believed all of his life in a greater way as it was revealed to him. And what I find remarkable and what we find in the life of Paul is that it ta to, to obey is better than sacrifice, as, as the prophet Samuel said, but as we see from the life of Paul, it takes great sacrifice to obey. And Brother Branham said that Apostle Paul was a Bible scholar and a man who experienced so much, but he never rested his doctrine upon his, his experiences alone. Right. And I think that's very important that, we, that we, we know that because as believers, we experience so much. We, we have the blessing of his presence in a way that many people don't have it. We experience it so much, but it's important that we don't rest our doctrine on the experience alone. Right. And Paul did not do that. And he was, a, he was a Hebrew by birth, a citizen of Rome, and he studied in a Greek university. And so he was a well-rounded individual. He's well-educated, of course, but uh, if you look, the, the, the Jews had a concept of light. And I heard someone say this one time, he, he, they had a concept of what the light was, that God is light. 
And the Romans had this idea of glory, for the glory of Rome. And the Greeks uh, 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 just lifted up knowledge to the point that it was unhealthy. So the Jews understood the, the concept of light. The Romans uh, uh, went for the, the glory of Rome, and the Greeks were consumed by knowledge in the pursuit of such. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6, Paul, with his ability and his, his intellect um, and his revelation, and by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says, and he brings all three of those different components of his, his background together, and he says, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So he brings his Hebrew background, his Roman citizenship, and the knowledge of the Greeks and, and his understanding of that, and he brings it together, and he says, uh, 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 he, he takes the abstraction of the Messiah and brings it to the embodiment of the Lord Jesus Christ. All in, that, uh, all in that scripture, he commanded the light to shine out of darkness and hath shined in our hearts in the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It's magnificent. And uh, he says here in our text, a, a man with, with his intellectual ability, and he, he said many times as he was going around uh, different places, he said, I, I come not to you in the wisdom of man or the, with the enticing words of man's wisdom, I come to you in the power of God alone. But with his ability to think and, and to construct uh, an argument and with his background, he comes to this point in his life, uh, it, which was actually towards the end of, of his life when he wrote uh, the book of Galatians, with his tenacity for what he believed in. And with all of his experience, with all of his suffering, and most importantly, with his understanding of the revelation of the message of the hour, he says, God forbid that I glory in anything or anyone save the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, it's important, I believe, as believers that we grow in the knowledge of Christ. As the spirit of wisdom and of revelations, as it says in Ephesians, uh, I believe Ephesians 1.17, uh, as Paul, he prays that the, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. So as believers, as Christians, we, we must grow and in grace and in knowledge, we must mature the seed that God has placed inside of us. It grows and it produces fruit. It's not for the intention of just sitting there and looking pretty. The Christian life is to be manifested. It's to be exemplified. It's to be something that, that has an action uh, uh, from it. It's, it's to be in action. Uh, your faith is to be in action. God never in, in, intends for you to stay in the same place. He intends for you to do. You're not to be just hearers alone. You are to be doers of the word. And so we must take what we hear and we must grow in grace and in, in, in the knowledge of him by the spirit of wisdom and of revelation who is the Holy Ghost that works among us and in us. It's natural that we mature from the elementary things of Christ. As a newborn Christian, you, you learn things, you hear things that are new and fresh to you, but you must grow. You must increase your understanding. You must go forward in Christ. That is his intention, that's the goal, that's what happens when you water a plant, you receive growth. If you subject the plant to the right atmosphere, you have fruit. Amen. And so that's God's intention. We grow in revelation, we grow in the knowledge of him. Hebrews chapter six, uh, verses one through five, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment, and this we will do if God permit. So he's saying, and, and this is uh, 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 Paul saying to the Hebrew church, he says, this we will do if God permit. This is where you were. I want God to take you further. So don't stay where you are. We should move further than where we are. Don't just, don't just stagnate. The purpose of the Lord Jesus Christ in his people is to make them fulfill the word of God in their daily life. 
What is the purpose of, of, of God's word if it isn't to manifest in your own life, if it isn't to change you, if it isn't to mold you and shape you more into the likeness of Jesus Christ himself? That is the purpose of the word. That is what the word does is it changes. And so he's saying, this we will do if God permit. You've heard the gospel cry. You've desired the sincere milk of the word. As, as Peter said, as babies in Christ, you desired this once you tasted that the Lord was good. You desire the sincere milk of the word. And then Paul, he would uh, uh, later say to the Corinthians, um, later on, he said, I have, felled, I, have, I have fed you with milk and not with meat hitherto uh, because you are not able to bear it. So there is a time and a season when you are able to bear certain things and mature in revelation and understanding and God knows exactly where each one of you are. You should never feel ashamed if you don't understand something. God has a purpose in what you understand and what you know and what you can comprehend. You don't have to feel like you're... you're uh, 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 not as spiritual as somebody else and, and, and you, you, you condemn yourself for it, God knows exactly where you are in your walk with him. And he is the leader of your walk with him. Isn't that right? It's not, the, it's not a denomination. It's not the church. It's not any one pastor. It's God and the individual. And he is concerned about what you know, what you understand, and how you grow and the pace at which you grow. This we will do if God permit. And, and he said, uh, Paul said to the Corinthians, he said, I'm, I'm not able to feed you yet because you're not there. So you do grow. You will get there. Just give a time and, and, and give yourself to the Lord so he can take you there. So the Holy Ghost can take you there. When you get ahead of God's timing, that's when you get yourself into all kinds of trouble. God knows when we're ready and he, he knows and he will grow you as you need. 1 Corinthians 3, 7, so neither is he that planteth anything, nor he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. It's God that increases what you know, what you understand, what you have in your heart. It's he that does the, the, the building and the growing. Then Peter comes right along in 2 Peter in chapter 1, in verse 10 through 14, and he says, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if ye do these things, you shall never fall. And for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things. Though ye know them and be established in the present truth, yea, I think it meet as long as I am in the tabernacle to stir up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as the Lord Jesus Christ, ha uh, Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. He says, now listen, I know that you're established in the present truth, but I pray and I hope that I can stir up what is inside of you and bring to your remembrance the things that you are to do, to bring to your remembrance the things that are perhaps more elementary. He says, if you do these things, then you will never, fa you will never fail. And I believe, and I, as, as what's been on my heart for the past couple of weeks, and it's just been pressing on my heart. It's pressing on my heart even before Brother Chad asked me to come and speak. There is one passage of Scripture that I pray never becomes common to me. And I also pray that it never becomes common to you. As I fear there is a danger of it becoming so. As, as I was thinking in just in my own heart and in my own mind, I, I felt like I had lost just the, the impact of it. It's, the, it's, it's Matthew chapter 27, verse 27 through 56. It's the story of Calvary. The story of the cross. I hope that that passage, Matthew chapter 27, that it never becomes common to me. I feel there's many people, and sometimes they've lost the impact or the feeling. It's not about feeling, we know that. It's not about feeling alone. But they've lost the impact of the cross, the passion of the Christ. 
Peter, he says, and in, in, in Paul, uh, Paul says, I, I pray that you, you'd grow in grace and in knowledge. And then Peter comes right behind and he says, you've been established in the present truth, but I bring to you remembrance. I want to stir up that which you know, that which you know to be the truth. I believe uh, we're in danger of the magnitude of the cross, and perhaps I'm just speaking from personal experience, so uh, forgive me, if you will, but I believe some, sometimes we're in danger of losing the magnitude of the cross to where it becomes common to us, and it has no impact. It doesn't move us. Emotionally, it doesn't move us, but it, and, and, and we, emotion is, is good. A lot of times we say it, it, it's, it's, it can be dangerous, and it can be, but emotion is good. God gave it to you for a reason. He made you that way for a reason, and to be moved by what, what, what Christ did for us as a group of believers with the understanding that we have, with the revelation that we have, with the depth of the mystery that we have, and to not be moved by the cross. What a shame. It's often the, the first thing that you are taught when you're a young Christian, new in the faith, but as time goes on, you learn new things, you grow and you mature. But as you grow spiritually in the message of the hour, you experience amazing things uh, that, mo that most people on this planet uh, 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 could never experience. Um, you, you, you experience the presence of God in a way that most people will never have the privilege of experiencing. The vast majority of the people on the earth will never uh, uh, be in the midst of a group of believers who are worshiping God as they should and, and, and praising the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And you have that privilege, and not only that, you, you have that privilege several times a week. And you step into that, and you experience that, and you go through that, and you have that, 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 that honor of being in that presence. You grow in grace and in knowledge, and you're, you, you, you are the grace, the only grace, that the world will ever experience. You and, and your relationship with Christ, and them seeing who you are, is the, is the only grace that they will ever see. And you are that grace to them. You, as a, as a result of your uh, uh, relationship with Christ, as a result of the presence of God in our midst, uh, uh, you are hidden from the storm that, that rages in the hearts of everyone that does not know the goodness of Christ. You are hidden from that storm. And when we think we have problems, we are hidden from so much. And, and however 2020 has impacted you, you are hidden and, and, and hidden under the wing of, 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 of Christ more than you realize. Yes, you are kept from evil more than you realize. God won't tempt you more than what you can bear, but you are kept from the evil one much more than you could ever understand. And, and the enemy that lurks in the shadows and, and um, wants to pounce on you and is kept by the grace and mercy of God. And you have that privilege. You fight the enemy on a daily, on an hourly basis, but you don't fight the, victory, uh, fight the enemy for victory. You fight the enemy from a position of victory. You are victorious. You are an invincible army. And thus, you fight the enemy not for the victory, not for the win. You fight from a position of the win. You've already got the win. That's who you are. You experience the richness and, and the goodness of God Almighty, and, and you, you have to keep yourself humble about it. We've come so far in the opening of the word, in the revelation that we have, Amen. and it's a good thing. All of those are good things. But I believe in the midst of all this, so many times, we can fail to remember even though we say it over and over and over, that there was a real man, Jesus of Nazareth, that was beaten and bruised. He was a lamb led to the slaughter so that you could say and have all of what I just said. He did that so that you could sit here and have all of that. The Apostle Paul says, 
Far be it from me to boast in anything or anyone save the cross of Jesus Christ. May we never trivialize the cross. May we never do that. Christ's death and burial and resurrection is, is not elementary. In my opinion, it's one of the deepest subjects that you could possibly talk about. It's, it's the reason that we are here. And with the revelation of the opening of the word, you can look back and see the truth of what the resurrection really was to us. We can see what the resurrection produces in us with, with the understanding that we have. And, and, and within the remembrance of the cross lays the mystery of your future, you, you, your expected end. In, within the mystery of the cross lays your expected end. And I, I believe by his grace and by his mercy towards you, the reason that the cross is so important, the reason that we should never trivialize it, the reason that it should never lose its impact on us as individuals and move us emotionally is because the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in you today. The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, it dwells in every single one of you. You may be tired, you may be anxious, you may be depressed, you may be uh, uh, worried about the week ahead, you may be worried about your job loss, you may have any of the issues that come as a result of living in Laodicea, but you have inside of you the resurrection power. You have inside of you the same power that brought Jesus Christ from the grave. It lays inside of you. And God promised in Isaiah 55, the word will not come back to me void. It will not come back to me without have achieving what I set it out to accomplish. And you have a promise in you that the same uh, power that was in Jesus Christ that raised him from the dead is inside of you today. That's why we should never lose the impact and the emotional uh, um, uh, impact of the cross of Jesus Christ. May there be inspiration in the present that comes from the remembrance of the cross. Revelations 12, and, and the bride uh, uh, overcame Satan uh, himself by the blood of the Lamb. We can see this story from Genesis to Revelation, the story of the cross. But before even that, in the mind of God and the foundation of the world, even before the beginning, it was in the mind of God. 1949, the deity of Jesus Christ. Brother Branham, he says, the same power of Christ that was hung on Calvary's cross, the same God that raised him up in the day of resurrection is in you now. And you that's got the Holy Ghost, oh, don't you love him? Oh, hear his voice today. You know, the interesting thing, uh, I know some of you, I was talking to Brother Rich last night about the, um, the trip that they took to Israel. And you know, I stood at Golgotha's hill, and I've looked at it, and I've been there, I've been at the tomb. And you know, I, I never experienced any power there. I, I, I felt let down. I'll be completely honest with you. I, I was there, and I was expecting this, you know, great feeling, and I felt nothing. I was recently, I was on a work trip and I was in Louisville and I went by Brother Branham's grave and I was standing there and I was thinking, this is Brother Branham's grave. I had never been there just until recently. And uh, uh, I, I was standing there and I was looking at it and I was thinking, man, this is Brother Branham's grave. And I felt nothing. I went to the place where the angel uh, came down in the, in, the, in, the, in the place and I matched it up with the photo and was standing right there and I was thinking, this is awesome but I felt very little. And you know what came to me is a realization that, oh, it's not there anymore. It's in me. I realized, oh, that's, that's, that's why. This is an amazing place. It's sacred to God. It's an amazing place. It's an amazing piece of geography on the face of the earth, but God is not there anymore. He's in me. And I realized that, that the power that was there has transformed itself into me. Why, I don't know. I still ask the question why, but it is. And I believe it is, and my faith makes it so. 
and I'm there by the revelation of Jesus Christ as the spirit of wisdom and of revelation works in the knowledge that we have of him. He brings you into an awareness that you are the Godhead bodily. May the cross have its full effect in us today. I, I, I pray that it would, may the, may, I, I pray that it would move you today. I, I pray that as, as, as just in thinking of it, just in bringing it up, that it would remind you of who you are. Because of, of Calvary's cross, sin was finished. Because of Calvary's cross, those who accept it, your victory over death was won. Because of Calvary's cross, your healing was signed, sealed, and delivered. Amen. Your healing was signed, sealed, and delivered. Amen. Because of the cross, your anxiety, your depression, your mental struggle, your issues was won and finished. Because of Calvary's cross. Because of Calvary's cross, you as the elect of God, you see your redemption story clearly unfolding before you. And your eternal future of godliness and peace and joy was purchased for you Amen. because of Calvary's cross. No matter how humble you are or how spiritual you are or how knowledgeable you are, no matter how, uh, 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 how, how high you may feel, you and me are on the same level kneeling before the cross. Amen. No matter how good you've been or how bad you've been, Amen. you and me are on the, on the same level as we kneel before the cross. We're on equal ground. You're, we're, we are on equal ground because it was God that brought us there. Amen. You didn't choose to find yourself to the foot of the cross. It was he that brought you there. Amen. You, didn't, you didn't choose to find yourself to the place where sin would be finished for you. He brought you to that place. He brought you to, to the foot of the cross. It, it, uh, for God so loved the world that he gave. He brought you to that place. You are here this morning, not by your own doing, but because God loved you. I, I pray that impacts you. We're all sitting in this room today because he loved you. God forbid that we should glory in anything or anyone save the cross of Jesus Christ. If you have your Bibles open to Matthew 27, uh, uh, and, and forgive me um, uh, for, for doing this. Uh, 5,000 years ago, Abraham is walking up the mountain with a promise in his son, and he's going to express his faith in God, not an intellectual faith, but a real genuine faith. He's going to offer his son as an expression of his faith in God. And Abraham was there with his son, and he has the dagger, and he's, he's bringing it down on his son, and God stops him and says, Abraham, uh, because you have done this, your seed shall possess the gates of the enemy. And Daniel would write later on in, in, in Daniel 7, 18, he said, the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever. And Abraham called that place uh, that, that, that happened when the angel stopped his hand. He called it Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. And 2,000 years ago from this point, uh, um, on the same mount Abraham was to sacrifice Isaac, uh, he fulfilled the promise. God fulfilled the promise on Golgotha's hill on Calvary, and he took his son up that hill. And as the knife was coming down, that time it didn't stop. God led his son up Calvary's hill, and the knife was not, not withheld. Because it is, is written uh, in Isaiah, the word will not return unto him void. It was predestinated to be so. Brother Branham said in 1956, he said, in the era of God's deliverance shot from a bow, I love that title. He says, look yonder at Calvary where a man hung on the cross and died. And the only real example that was ever put on the wor in the world for human beings to live by is the man, Christ Jesus. Uh, again, forgive me if you will, 
but I don't know the last time that you've read this. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 27. If you would, let's start in verse 27. Now this is before, uh, uh, and I'm just going to go over this as time allows. Judas, who was foreordained uh, to um, his condemnation, betrayed uh, Jesus already, and the, the, the sham trial, uh, which wasn't even really a trial at all, it's basically a mob, the Sanhedrin, they delivered Jesus to Pilate, and um, Pilate plays uh, politics, and, and he learned the inner, workings, uh, the inner workings of God's perfect will and how little power he actually had, and uh, uh, we all learn that lesson at some point or another. And they release Barabbas, and Jesus is condemned to the cross, and Pilate washes his hands, and the, the people themselves cry out, his blood be upon us and they, were, uh, they remain in their, their blindness to this day. And then starting in verse 27, then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers and they stripped him and put him on a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his hand and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him saying, hail, king of the Jews. And they spit upon him and they took a reed. They smote him on the head. And after that, they had mocked him. They took the robe off from him. They put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. As a society, I I believe that we have become numb to violence. It doesn't impact you. Especially if you're around Hollywood at all. It doesn't impact you. You don't feel it. Even if you've seen news stories of bombings or whatever it may be, violence doesn't impact us as a society hardly anymore. Some people who are more responsive to blood than others, but violence as as a whole does not impact us. And if you think about this, for the Romans, the Romans who gloried in, in uh, uh, it was a sport for people to have hand-to-hand combat with swords and spears and to, to cut each other open, only it to be finished off by predatory animals if they survived in an arena and they called that sport, for them, there had to be something far worse for a criminal. If they called that sport, and it was around that time that Rome fell when sports was at its apex... And if they called that sport, then there had to be something far worse for a criminal. That's what the Romans did. Hollywood has done its best to capture the scene of the passion of the Christ. But I don't think we, I don't think we fully grasp it. We can read just, just, so, just so casually, and they stripped him, and they put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, I don't know if, if you've ever seen the actual thorns that they would put on his head, but those bushes are, are all around, and they're, they're two or three inch uh, 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 thorns, very narrow, very sharp. And they took that, and they, 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 they pushed it down on, on Jesus' head. The, the Savior, the man that the disciples called um, Master, the one that we, we, we look to, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, because he was the word made flesh. And we, we think about that. We think about that, that man who was there. And I wonder how much it actually moves us, what actually went on. Because it was your sins and it was my sins that put him there. After that, they had mocked him. They took the robe off. They took Jesus and they beat him until his bones laid bare. Brother Branham said they, they beat him until his bones stared at you. As the psalmist wrote in Psalm twenty two seventeen. I may, I may tell all my bones that they stare upon me. And I just, I just want you, and forgive me for, for um, speaking on such an elementary level, but it's pressing on my heart. Don't, don't miss the opportunity to grasp the humanity of the situation. Don't, don't miss the opportunity to, to remember the horrible nature of, of what happened to Jesus Christ. I, I think the Romans uh, believe that this method of humiliation, of, of, of beating, of, of uh, crucifixion was more a scare tactic than it was anything else. If people would witness this in capital punishment, perhaps they would just, um, they would, um, uh, 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 be persu- dissuaded away from crime, and I agree with him. 
It was the most painful death that they could concoct to beat him, to, to mock him, to strip him naked to an open shame, and for him to willingly submit to it. He knew that it was going to happen. He prayed, Lord, would this, would, could this cup pass from me? And yet he willingly submitted himself to that kind of brutal torture in the pain and the severity of being beaten like that and, and the, 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 the blood running out of him even before all of this, the, the, the horrible nature of the actual cross took place. And he's there. Remember Isaiah 53, it says, for he was wounded for our transgressions. And he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. 55, in, in uh, the Redeemer and Redemption, once place your hands by faith on the head of the Lord Jesus, feeling the, 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 the pains of his suffering yonder at Calvary in your stead. Remember, it was your sins that done it to redeem you. He did it. God himself become flesh so that he could pull the stinger out of death. They mocked him, and I think few group, fewer groups of people could be more obscene and, and uh, uh, horrible to be around than a group of Roman soldiers. And they said that the band of soldiers, the entire band came around him. They prodded him with a stick. They gave him a reed because a king needs a scepter. And they pressed the, the, the crown of thorns uh, uh, upon his head and pushed it down. And then uh, in verse uh, 32, it says, and they came out, they found a man named uh, uh, Simon Cyrene uh, 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 by name. uh, Cyrene is a place in Libya that's about 900 miles away. And uh, they actually, um, uh, he had traveled over 900 miles to be there for the Passover because there was a group of Jews at that time. There was a group of Jews in that, that, that place and they would have most likely been in Jerusalem because of that. And so he was there you never know what, what the Lord is doing in your footsteps, uh, to, to guide your footsteps to where you are today. And, and Simon was there, and they asked him to come, and, uh, and they compelled him to bear his cross, verse 33. And when they were come unto a place called Golgotha, that is to say a place of a skull, Jesus was to carry his own cross through the Via Della Rosa. I've walked that. It's a long walk. Most likely he carried uh, only the vertical beam, which, have, which according to the lumber that was there, would have weighed about 100 to 200 pounds. I, I don't know exactly, I'm, I'm just assuming. This was during the Passover, so there were busy people all along the streets. People running about, families in town. This walk is, is a long walk, and in the heat, it's hot. It's a miserable, it's a, it would be a miserable place to be. In 34, verse 34, they gave him vinegar to drink and mingled it with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. Uh, according to, to the research that I could do, that was a cheap Roman wine, and it was mixed with gall. It was actually a, almost a, a sensory uh, um, relieving drug. So it was actually a cheap wine, a vinegar wine, that would actually relieve or dull temporarily the senses. So when it says here that he, he uh, drank Uh, mingled with gall, and when he had tasted it thereof, he would not drink. So he knew what it was, and he wouldn't drink it. In other words, he wanted to bear the full impact of the pain that he was just about to endure. He refused, uh, uh, for better lack of the term, the Advil that he could have taken, the Tylenol that he could have taken. He said, I don't want any of it. He refused it. He said, I want to feel the full impact of the pain and of the anxiety that I'm about to go through. 35, and they crucified him. They parted his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. They crucified him. They, they, you, you probably know much of this is what I'm saying. And uh, again, I apologize for being so elementary. But perhaps some of you need to hear this. Maybe, maybe this, is, this is what you need to hear today. There's also children here who perhaps need to, f- to, to hear the impact of the cross. There was, um, they, they would take, and he, he most likely carried the long beam uh, uh, that was there, or, or the, the cross beam that was there, and they would tie the cross beam to them. It was about 100, 200 pounds, and they, they walked him to the place of the skull on Calvary's hill, and then he was there, and then they would take that and place it on the main beam, which was 
uh, uh, typically ready to be hoisted or already there. Um, and then they would hoist him up with ropes or whatever it would be, pulley systems. And so they, they had him there, and then they would, they would put the, the individual down, and they would take the nail, which uh, uh, there was a, a body exhumed in Jerusalem near, uh, near around the city that uh, uh, was actually crucified by the Romans during that time. They dated it back to that time. And they, they knew that the, the nails would have been probably seven, eight, nine inches long, and they would be tapered uh, iron nails. And they'd be very sharp, and they would, they would just, that's what they used for the crucifixion was that length of a nail. And so they, they would put it, some say they put it on his wrists. Thomas said, I want to feel his hands. And Jesus said, I want to put it in my hands. So I believe they put it in his hands. And uh, the hands are not able to, to handle that weight. So when you, put, when you put the nail, that's why a lot of people think they put it on the wrists because the hands are, the, the wrist can handle the body weight of a, of a 150 pound man, but the hands cannot, they would just tear apart. And so uh, wherever they put the nail, they would put it there and they drove it in and they drove both nails in and then they put the feet typically on a, on a little step or something like that and they put both of his feet there and they, they nailed the feet down and what would happen is they, they, because of that support, they would let their, their knees go a little bit because they felt the support. So they'd push themselves up and Jesus at this point was, was very bloody and his blood had, 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 had uh, largely let out. And so he, he didn't, they wouldn't have the strength. And so they made this as excruciating as they possibly could. And so when he was there, they, they, would, they would let the, 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 the cross uh, uh, do its work and they would let their knees give way and it would put the pressure on the hands. And then when they did that, it would restrict the, the lungs to the point where they couldn't breathe in. Or, or breathe out, so they could, they could inhale, but they couldn't exhale. And so they'd have to push themselves up on that little post where, where their feet were, where, which were nailed into the, 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 the post. So it was excruciating pain, and they'd have to do that to exhale, and then they would let themselves go down. And eventually that, that excruciating pain w- would, would give way, and, and they would die. But typically it took a long time, almost nine hours to die. So that's why they would come by and take a, a post and break the knees of the individual. They'd stab them. They'd do whatever they could to get them to die because the Roman soldiers didn't want to just stay out there until they died, they, 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 unless they wanted to leave them out there for, for, for a longer time, in which case the birds and everything would come and, 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 and pick at it. And this, this, is, this is what Jesus endured. And... Uh, I was, I, was just, I was just sitting in my office, and I was just thinking of this. And uh, uh, like Ben, sitting in his office, and you just, the, the Lord just moves you in certain ways. And I, I just began to cry. And I realized in myself, I don't think I've ever cried about this. I don't think that I have ever cried after reading what happened to the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross which he did for me. He took on my inability to save myself. He, he endured that excruciating pain and, and, and refused anything that would dull his senses. He, he, he wanted to feel the, the full impact of the pain for me. He, he, he did that so that I could stand here today and say with faith, I am redeemed. I am the redeemed. I I realized I don't think I had ever cried about it. And you can imagine the people that were around, you can imagine the disciples who were witnessing this, not not filled with the Holy Ghost yet, and they were witnessing this, and they were thinking, what on earth? I, I imagine it may have been very similar to the people who surrounded Brother Branham right after he died, a horrible car accident. Uh, It didn't make sense at all. And people are saying, what do we do now? He left no instruction on uh, uh, on what the church should do after he passed away, speaking of Brother Branham. He left no instruction on, okay, now this is what happens. This guy needs to start this church. Uh, Brother Perry needs to go here. Brother Biscoe needs to go there. You need to have all these different guys doing this. He left no instruction. Everybody just went home. They didn't know what was to happen. But then they began to get into the word. 
Then they began to go back into what he actually said, and he said, now, was, what, what did he actually say? Then you began to see the books come out, and people got the word, and they began to get in the word. It was an exact fulfillment of Revelations 10, 8 through 11, where John took the book, and it became a part of him. In other words, they caught the vision. They were around it, and they saw it, and very few of them actually understood the impact of what was happening until they caught the vision. And that's when God fulfilled his own word and filled them with the revelation of the hour and then it spread around to the rest of the world. I imagine the people around Jesus Christ may have experienced the same type of feeling. What on earth is going on? This, this was supposed to be the man that was gonna lead us out of, out of Roman captivity or this was the man that was supposed to lead us into the very heavens it, 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 themse- it, itself and, and he's, he's dying like this. I can't imagine what it would have been like to have been able to say from the people that were there, uh, I saw the actual blood of Jesus Christ on that cross. I actually saw the, the actual blood of Jesus Christ run red. In 39, and they passed and reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, that thou destroyest the temple and buildest it up in three days, save thyself if thou be the son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, uh, also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and the elders, and they said, he saved others and himself he cannot save. And if he be the king of Israel, then let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. And he trusted in God, and let him deliver him now, and he will, they, they made an open mockery of him. And now in the sixth hour, verse 45, there was a darkness over all the land, Unto the ninth hour, and in the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Mm-hmm. Brother Branham said in 1959, he said, living, dying, buried, rising, and coming. He said, but because he died of grief, he, he, because he came to his own and his own received him not, he died of a broken heart. And when he knowed the very creatures of time that, that he would die to redeem, had spit on his face, and he was rejected of man. I think Brother Branham said that about someone else that had said that he died of a broken heart. In verse 51, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain and from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent in the temple. The earthquake that happened as a result of the crucifixion It had ripped the veil in the temple from the top to the bottom. So no man did that ripping. God ripped it because it was from the top to the bottom. In 1961, in Abraham's grace covenant, he says, and now that was, uh, he's saying, uh, I'm going to take the covenant like this, Abraham, and he took the uh, the Abraham and showed him uh, what he was going to do with Jesus Christ, the seed of Abraham caused uh, uh, through Abraham come Isaac, and Isaac come Christ, and through Christ, the supreme sacrifice was made. And all these others was natural seed. Israel, 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 Israel. But through Christ, open the veil to either Jew or Gentile, Greek, bond or free, male or female, and that we all might enter into the Shekinah glory, which was only for Jews alone, but now it's for whosoever will. Let him come. In 1 Peter 3.18, it says, For Christ, who also hath suffered for sins, but just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but being quickened in the spirit. I I was sitting there in my office and I began to ask, uh, just as I was reading this and I was just um, in tears and I, I, the the question um, always comes, why? Why did he have to do this? And I I believe that we know that um, uh, uh, and, and you don't have to turn there, but John chapter 12 and verse 24, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. And I think a, a, a part of you may ask, uh, it, whether it impacts you greatly or even a little bit, of, of what happened in, in, when he was bruised for our iniquity and when he was crucified. However much it moves you, there's a part of you that may ask, why did this have to happen? It doesn't make sense to us. 
Why, why, did it, why didn't he just freely give it to us? Why didn't he just freely redeem us? Why, 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 why didn't he uh, d- just, just uh, totally do away with sin and, 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 and death? Why didn't he just totally do away with it? Why, why this process? And in John, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Now, we know that uh, within uh, the message, uh, we know that there is the law of reproduction. We know that very well, <clears throat> and we're very familiar with it, uh, uh, how every seed can bring forth of its own kind. So we know that if, if you put an apple seed in the ground, the law of reproduction says you will get apples. If you, if you put this in the ground, if you put corn, you'll get corn. Uh, the, the law of reproduction is, is alive and well. But uh, uh, it, it's, uh, uh, the other part of that overriding the law of reproduction is the law of life and death. So overriding the, the, the law of reproduction is the law of life and death because in the reproduction of the plant, there is life, but there is also death. So for the law of reproduction to work, there must be overriding it the law of life and death. In 1960, um, in, the, in the five identifi- identifications of the true church of the living God, he says the first thing he created was angels to worship him. Then he becomes God. So Isaiah 14 uh, uh, describes how Lucifer in his heart was conceived uh, to exalt himself above the throne of God and, uh, uh, and gets down from the realm of heaven and, uh, and so God separated the light from the darkness and we see that in, in Genesis there was, uh, there was light and, and the light was separated from darkness in 1955 and I will restore. He says now the book of Genesis is the beginning. The very word Genesis means the beginning. Now everything began in Genesis. Evil began in Genesis. Good began in Genesis. Life began in Genesis and death began in Genesis. What I find is that people acknowledge that there is life. You acknowledge that there is life, that the life of God, the presence of God is, is among us here uh, 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 in, in his life. And we understand that, uh, uh, that there is life in them, but oftentimes we understand uh, um, the, the, the fact that without death, that life could not be there. Because life comes only through death. In uh, Genesis, God creates man and places uh, him in the garden and puts the law in place, the law of life and death. The death is a consequence of, of, of breaking the word. So we're, he's there in the Garden of Eden, and Eve was nowhere present when he placed the law of life and death in order. And I find that interesting that, that Eve wasn't there. Um, uh, 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 there, there was no, uh, if, if, if um, uh, uh, she was not present in bodily form, if you will, when God set the, the, the law of life and death in order. Um, death wasn't a concept that was foreign to God, where, where uh, uh, one day the woman pulled from the man's side, messed everything up. That's not how it happened. Death was a concept to God before there ever was a man, before there was a woman. God had in his mind that there would be uh, death because he placed in the word, this is the tree of life, this is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He said to eat thereof is death and to eat this is life. And Eve was not present when he said that. So the, the overriding the law of reproduction is the, is the law of life and death. In 1965, God's chosen place of worship. And that's just what God has, two different laws. And one of them is the law of death and the other one is the law of life. God has two laws. Follow him and serve and worship him is life. To reject him is death. God has two laws. 1962, from that time, there was a time when there was no death on the earth. There was a time when man didn't have to die, but because Eve reasoned, listened to Satan's reasons against God's word, death began to reign from that time on. And we know that the blood of the lamb, which was slain, was slain before the foundation of the world. So God had his, in mind the idea of a slain lamb. He had the idea of death before there ever was the foundation of the world itself. Death was not a foreign concept to God. It was not something that came in and messed the plan of life. In order to receive life, God placed in order the law of life and death. Life can only come from death. It was under a conditional basis. You cannot eat thereof, and death came uh, through the woman. Life comes from the male. Life comes from Christ. He is the author of life. And when Satan rejected God and and wanted to be like him and and, and separated 
uh, 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 separated, death was, was separated from life, but there was death created, there was life, there was the original seed, there was the word, a thought expressed, and yet all of the attributes were in the mind of God, and there was the lamb slain. So when there was God, when the word uh, was there in the beginning with God and the, and the word was God, there was also the slain lamb. Amen. Now we take, in 1959, a bomb in Gilead, and I want you to listen close to this. Now we take a grain of corn and put it on in, in the ground, and it may be a pretty grain of corn, all polished up, looks real nice, but as long as it remains in that condition, that's all it'll ever be. So you can have a seed, you can have an apple seed, you can have a, a grain of corn, you can have whatever you want, and it's beautiful and it's nice, and you can polish it, but as long as it remains in that form, that's all it will ever be. And so we find then, because the, the, the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world, there was more for there to come from the word, from the seed, than just to be the word. There was more to it than just to be God in himself alone as the word. He says, now, sometimes we join church and a lot of pretty things in it and maybe so forth and maybe we try to um, uh, uh, do uh, pretty ourselves up and go to church and got a new something or another uh, to wear to church and is that all church means to you? Then I'm persuaded that you need a new birth. It's exactly right. That grain of corn will never produce any new life until the old grain rots away from it. Now... The important concept to understand is that in the scripture we see that if a grain of corn abides alone and it goes into the ground and dies, then it will bring forth much fruit. But if you plant that grain of corn into the ground and you, you, you see that we are a seed word bride, so don't lose the analogy here. So you see the seed go into the ground. If you take that piece of uh, uh, seed and you go back a few months later when the stalk is there and you pull it out of the ground and you look for the seed, the seed is gone. There is no more seed. What it did is it produced something else. And what you have to understand is that death is not to die. It is merely a transformation. To die is not death, it is merely a transformation. So if you go back and try to find the seed, it's changed its form, it's not there anymore. So if, you, if a corn of wheat goes in a corn, a, 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 a corn of corn, goes down into the ground and abides alone, it dies. But, be, but through death comes life. And this was a concept that was in God's mind before the foundation of the world because the lamb was slain then. And so, if you pull the, the seed up then and you look at it and you see more corn on top, it died and it produced more fruit. What it did is it didn't just remain its form that, in that sense, it moved up into the plant. The very life that was on the inside of the seed changed its form, it rotted off the core of the seed and it moved up into the plant and now the seed is gone. It's no more the seed now, it's the fruit in which it produced. So the very concept of life is it cannot exist without there being death. Death is a means of transformation. In order for you to have the same resurrection power that Jesus had on the cross, he had to go into the ground and die. He had to receive the sins of those who he was dying for so that you could revive in newness of life. When the new birth comes in, it cannot come until there's a death first, and people don't want to die. I, I believe it was in um, a perfect uh, um, um, st uh, strength in perfect weakness sermon. I believe that was a sermon when he said, what we need is a good old-fashioned dying out. He says now in this sermon, Balm and Gilead, he says now people don't want to die. They don't want the simple leadings of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes I think we can fight against the simple leadings of the Holy Spirit without even realizing it. People don't want to die, but, but there cannot be life until death first. They want to take their own thinking of it, and you can't take your own th your, your thoughts. You got to think his thoughts. Let the mind of God of Christ be in you. Amen. And then when it's in you, as far as the world concerned, it'll bring new life, and it'll bring resurrecting life. It'll bring new thoughts. It'll bring a new person. It'll bring a new faith. It'll bring you from death unto life. Amen. 
Now there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. They have passed from death unto life. So in the cross of Jesus Christ, and I believe I said this the last time I was here, but I just want to go over it again briefly. If, if, if um, uh, we see in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that uh, Christ was clearly the second Adam, and we see that if the first Adam, if, if the wife was taken from Adam's side, then in the second Adam, he, she would also have to be taken from his side. And so that's how we know that we are, as it says in Ephesians chapter 5, I am flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone. And if we were there um, in the beginning with God, as it says we were, if the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world, then he had the idea of the cross in his mind before there ever was a foundation of the world, before there ever was a person. Because the law of life and death overrides the law of reproduction. And so he had this concept of death, but he had this concept of life coming from death. It wasn't just the word, it was to produce more word. It was to produce a bride for his son. And so in the first Adam, there was Eve. In the second Adam, there was also an Eve. But when, we were, when, when the word was in the beginning, the word was with God, and the word was made flesh, and it dwelt among us, then it, it, it was he in the beginning, we were in Christ because we were flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone. How many of you believe that you are flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone? You were there in the beginning with God because you were in the mind of God then. You were in the mind of God because you are an attribute of God. That portion of your soul that's in you that is eternal, it was with God in the very beginning before there was a foundation of the world. So you were there with him he was the word, he was with God, he was God, and then he comes and it, the, the, the word was made flesh and it dwelt among us. And so now the word is living among us and it dwells inside of us. Now Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus of Nazareth, he was there on the cross. And if he was there, Paul in Galatians 2.20, he says, I was crucified with Christ. Paul was not crucified with Christ in the natural so how could he say, I was crucified with Christ? Nevertheless, it is not me who lives, it is Christ who lives in me. So if he could say, I was crucified with Christ, then that means that he must have still been in Christ. And if the first Eve was taken from Adam's side and to be flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone, then that means that the second Eve must still have been inside of Christ when he was on the cross. So that means that you, as the Word, were still in Christ when he was on the, on the cross. So that means that when he died and when he took unto himself death, when he took unto himself your sins and your iniquities and your wrongs and your depression and your anxiety and all of the things that you struggle with as human beings, when he was still on the cross, you were inside of him. You were in him there. And then he sent his Holy Ghost back to, as, as, as the ages rolled on, and as people pop up, they, they receive the word and they're anointed of the Holy Ghost. And that seed, that, that eternal seed, they become the seed word bride by understanding the revealed word of the hour, walking in the light, and they receive the Holy Ghost. And then they are made alive in Christ. They step into that stream of eternity. They step back into that stream of eternity. So Christ was there in the beginning, he was the word, and then he was on the cross, he was still male and female on the cross. God hasn't taken that, that female portion out of him yet. And then he dies and he goes into the ground, and the reason that we have uh, a death is to produce life, because to die is not death. And so he, ra he raises again, and when he raises again, we rose with him. And that is how Paul could say, I am no longer, I am, I am crucified with Christ. I was there in him on the cross. And now it's no longer me who lives, it's Christ who lives in me. Amen. Nevertheless, we live. You don't dig the plant up and see the seed. The seed grows up into itself and it produces fruit. And you see the fruit. Amen. You are the fruit. Amen. You are what Christ produced as a result of going into the ground and dying and producing life. So the very reason that we can say it is, it is uh, the, the same power that raised up Christ from the dead also dwells in your mortal bodies and it will raise your mortal bodies. The reason we can say that is because we were in the mind of Christ before the foundation of the world. And then when he was on the cross, 
you were on the cross with him. And then he pulled the bride out of himself, the second Eve. Then you have the consequent uh, uh, seven church ages. Life, Christ died and we died to ourselves to change into the likeness of the seed that's in there. God did this to express himself. That's why he put the law of death in order before Eve was even in the picture is because he had the intention of producing life in you. When we think about the cross, when we think about the passion of the Christ, I pray that it moves you, but it's not the end of the story. It's not the end of the story. And as he was there, I, I, I don't believe that God, I don't, I don't think the angel moved the stone to let God out. I think he removed the stone to let us in. Amen. And so we, we get in and he's not there. And he comes back and he, and he says, uh, um, uh, 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 he he comes back, just to, just to say it simply, he comes back in Revelations 1.18, he says, uh, uh, in Revelations 1.18, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Only through death comes life. Jesus, as a result of his death, he crossed Jordan's river, and then he comes back across Jordan's river because of my inability to save myself. Sin was atoned for, healing was atoned for. 1965 in the Easter seal, Brother Benham, says he is the judge and we are the witnesses that he's redeemed us. And in us lays by the grace of God today that resurrecting power. Romans 6, 4, he says, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead in the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. In Colossians 2, he says, he made a show of the enemies of the principalities and the powers of this world openly, triumphing over it. I don't, I don't think any of us in this room will ever understand how someone could love us so much to do that. I just don't think we will. I think fathers have a greater grasp of it in, in, in the thought of actually, uh, uh, in, as Abraham did in type, uh, of, of actually having to sacrifice his, his, his son and, being will, and having the willingness to obey the word because the obedience to the word requires great sacrifice. I don't think any of us will ever really truly understand what that meant. But you know, I, I, I believe this with all of my heart. I believe that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I believe as human beings, we all struggle. Um, many are the afflictions of the righteous. We go through many different trials and, and, and situations. We go through many different mental issues, health issues. We're not exempt from that. We're not exempt from corona. We live in this world, we're not of it. But I want you to grasp the reality of this, that he who raised Jesus Christ from the dead, man who endured all of that, and died and rose again, the same power that rose him from the dead, it's inside of you. And, you th and you're sitting there and you think, I believe that, Brother Steve. I don't understand it, I can't fully grasp it, but I believe it. And then you're thinking, in me, really? The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, it dwells in you today. This is not a tomorrow thing. This is not next week. It's right now. For healing, for deliverance from the things that you struggle with, Life can only come through death. And he, he died so that we could have life this morning. So in the face of that, and in that revelation, as, as, as Jesus said to Peter, upon this rock I will build my church upon the revelation of who he is, the gates of hell cannot prevail against that revelation. 
And, and the new birth, it's simply put by Brother Bannum, was the revelation of who Jesus Christ is to you personally. And so to, to look back in the remembrance of the cross lays the mystery of your future. And to, to remember that and to think about that and just, just to read the scripture, whether it impacts you greatly or not, just to, just to read that scripture and to know he did that because of me, he did that for me, and I am here because of him. And now sitting in your seats today is the same resurrecting power. And keep in mind that the word, it, it cannot return unto, unto God void. In other words, it won't accomplish what it was set out to accomplish. It, 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 won't, uh, it, it won't not accomplish that which it was set out to accomplish. It won't um, uh, uh, not achieve that which God intended for it to achieve in you. It can't do it. It's impossible. Amen. And so you sitting there and you're thinking, but I've got this and I've got this, and I'm dealing with this, and I'm struggling with this. Well, welcome to Laodicea. Hello, did you expect any different? What did you expect? Did you expect an easy life, laying on a bed of ease? Nope. <laughs> 2020 has proved you wrong. <laughs> and so we think about all the different things that we have. Oh, by the grace of God, we have those things so that God can overcome them in me so that he can prove himself alive in me, so therefore I glory in my infirmities. Therefore, whatever you're dealing with all throughout the room, which it could be vastly different one from another, could be very serious, it could be health, it could be mental, whatever it is, vastly different one from another, therefore glory in your infirmities. Because in your weakness, he is made strong. It's because he already paid the price for your sins, for your weakness, for your inequalities, that you can say, I'm the redeemed. You can sit here today and claim the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ as his elected of God because he paid the price, because life has come as a result of death. You have risen in newness of life and therefore, because he paid the penalty of death, because life can only come from death, because he paid the penalty of death, you have only life before you. You have only life before you. Whether or not you experience death in the natural, remember, to, de to die is not death. Amen. So whether you die in the natural, it is not death because Christ paid the penalty of death for you. Amen. So now, all you have in front of you is life. You are an invincible army. You say, oh, Brother Steve, I don't know what the will of God is for me. You've got it. This is the will of God for you. The decisions that you make, who you marry, those are, those are just stepping stones in the process of accomplishing his will concerning you. So many young people, they worry about, wow, you know, where, where do I go to school? What do I, what do I learn? What do I do for a job? Just relax. I, I believe uh, Brother Lonnie was the one that said the key to the spiritual is to relax. Just relax. This is the will of God concerning you. The decisions that you make, the, the, the scripture we were talking the other day, uh, yesterday, the scriptures of, of, a, of a good man are ordered by the Lord. The, the footsteps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. In other words, you may not know the, the decision that you need to make exactly. You may not have an exact word from the Lord. It takes footsteps in order to be ordered by the Lord. Amen. So just, pu just put your foot up and say, Lord, where do you want me to put it? Where do you want me to place it? You have all the power of heaven behind you, which is, in, he, he only acts in accordance to his word. So don't abuse that. He only acts in accordance to his word. So don't say, well, the Lord told me to do this, and then it's totally off the word. Come on now. But on the basis of the word, which is what the Holy Spirit acts upon, you have all the power of heaven behind you. So therefore, if you struggle with something, if you have need of, of, of healing, if you're worried about something, he is more than able you have been made more than conquerors. Because he paid the penalty of death, which life can only come through death, you, everybody in this room, you only have life before you. You've passed from death unto life. May we never trivialize the cross. Would you bow your heads? 
musicians would come. Brother Ben, Brother Chad. Brother Ben, if you would sing a, maybe a song or two and lead us in worship. I want to pray with you. Gracious Heavenly Father, God forbid we boast in anything or anyone save the cross of Jesus Christ. Lord, may we know, may we be stirred up, as Peter said, in the remembrance, may we be stirred up in us the reality of who we are in you. It's a revelation of who, you, who we are in you, in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord. Lord, in you, we, we can be, we can really be changed. We, we can really overcome. There's power behind the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you said you'd be in the midst of us when we gather in your name. And we believe that you are here. We know that you're here, Lord. And Lord, I I pray for the people in front of me. As Brother Nathan sang, I pray for my family. Lord, that we would know the full measure of the power of the cross. Lord, it's it's with the, the, the eyesight of an eagle. We can look back across the pages of history and we can see Lord, we are the elect of God. We we are the bride of Jesus Christ, but it's only through the cross. It's only through your death that we can say that we have life today. But Lord, may we not just be hearers of it, but may we be doers. May you help us to do. And and myself, and I'm sure many can say the same, Lord, And I think so many times, we just fail to do. And we think, oh, you know, I've got to do this and I've got to do that. But but it's not that. It's in resting in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in yielding to the Word of God. Lord, it's in surrendering. Lord, may we fully surrender everything to you. Maybe there's someone who hasn't done that yet. But Lord... Today is the day. May it not be tomorrow. May it not be next week. May I overcome. May you help me to overcome today. And tomorrow is going to be another battle for itself. But I'll deal with tomorrow tomorrow. Today, I want to surrender myself entirely to you. I I want to know the power of the resurrection in my life, in my daily walk with the Lord. I want to be able to overcome the, the, the enemy that sets itself before me. I want to know the reality of the power of the resurrection. Lord, would you grant it today? Would you move through our hearts, Lord? Lord, we're all on equal grounds before the cross. For that, I'm thankful. I think everyone in this room could say we're probably the lowest. Lord, we're all on equal grounds. Lord, together, may we say as the bride of Jesus Christ, Lord, if it weren't for the cross, where would we be? Move in our hearts, Lord, move in our minds. Bring both our mind and our hearts subject to the word of God. Grant it, Father, that you'd speak to us just in the stillness and the beauty of your presence. And in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Do we ask these things? And do we say thank you? Amen. And amen. I wonder if you'd stand. Brother Ben, won't you come and sing? In the cross, in the cross, be my glory.
praise the Lord. Amen. May it never become common to us. As our brother said, I enjoyed so much the reflection, the reminder of what God has done for us, but the present tense impact that it has on us today. It wasn't a reminder for reminder's sake. It was a reminder to refresh in us the reality of what today is. What was purchased for us, what was accomplished at Calvary is being manifest out today. It's a living reality of what God has done for us. So many things that were impacting me all over again as he began to speak is the crucifixion displays the cost of sin. The required punishment for failing the word. And Jesus took the required punishment, the wrath of God was poured out upon him because man had rejected the word of God and we had rejected the word of God. We had failed on the word and so he took my place. The crucifixion displays the cost of sin, but at the same time, it displays the value of God's elect. Because the value of something is the price you're willing to pay for it. And what was the price that God was willing to pay for his lost children? His own death on Calvary. So the two things, it, it displays the cost, the grievance that must be paid for in sin, but also the value that God esteems on you and I. But the blood of his only begotten son would be shed in exchange for the purchase price of my soul. That makes us more than just the dirt that we dwell in, but it makes us purchase dirt, something of great value to God. And I was reflecting on the statement Brother Branham said that tree of life was cut down. Out of the tree of life would come the bride tree, and the bride tree fully matured would be the tree of life restored back to him again. The seed that went in the ground would grow back to become the bride tree, and the bride tree would be the tree of life restored back again. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Another thing he said is the resurrection power is in us now. If the resurrection power, the same, the same spirit dwelling in us that dwelt in Christ, that raised him from the dead, it'll quicken your mortal bodies. And Brother Branham did not make that a future tense scripture. He made that a present tense scripture. He said, it'll quicken your mortal body. He said, it's already begun. You used to smoke, you used to drink, you used to lie, you used to lust. What was that that changed all of that? It wasn't your willpower, it was the quickening power of God. The same spirit that raised him from the dead is the same spirit that raised us out of dead denominationalism and false understanding of the word and all kinds of infractions and penalties in the sin, in the flesh. So if he's already done it, and he's already done it in us, then the change in the body is a foregone conclusion. Because he changed me from a life of sin to a life that serves him. He changed me from habits I couldn't overcome with willpower. He took away sinful desires. He quickened me out of dark denominationalism and gave me eyes to see. Amen, the body change is a foregone conclusion. I'm not worried about the body change. It's already changing. That's what Calvary has produced for us. It's a sure thing, it's not a guess. It's not a hope, it's faith. It's something that's already been accomplished. It's something that's already working. I'm not worried about what will work. I'm looking at what's working. And what's working will produce everything. Appreciate Brother Steve, his wife being here. I'm gonna say God bless him. God bless him for taking the time to remind us of what's been done for us and what it's producing now and what it will produce in the future. Let's pray for our brother that God will bless him. Amen. Let's just bow our heads and pray as we're dismissed. Lord Jesus, we thank you, Father. For God, when we were unable, you did for us what we could not do for ourselves. Lord, you foresaw, Lord, all these things and knew what they would be and you had a conclusion already in your mind. It was an accomplished work before it was ever acted out. God, in the acting out and the display of what was in your mind, we saw how horrible sin really is. When we saw what a horrible death our Savior died. 
We, re- we can look and we can realize the cost of sin, the price that had to be paid, displayed how horrible sin is. But also, God, that you would stop at nothing to redeem back your chosen ones. That you wouldn't leave us lost, Lord, that you wouldn't leave us in a fallen condition, but you intended, Lord, to raise us up for your glory. God, I pray that the reality of that would be a living reality in our everyday life, that this flesh would be taking on the reality of that quickening power that's within us, that it would change us into the likeness of Jesus Christ from glory unto glory. Day by day, Lord, decision by decision, may that spirit working in us keep quickening these bodies until the last final quickening changes these atoms. For we believe it, Lord, we see it, we're realizing it, it's going on all through us. God, thank you. All we can say is, thank you, Lord. We appreciate it. We're grateful, Lord. We're so blessed, Lord, by what we've been reminded. May may we never forget it, Lord, or take it for granted, but always with deep appreciation in our hearts, look to Calvary, Lord, with with a warmth inside, knowing that you paid the price and we are redeemed and the work is finished and I can rest in that. And may you today, Lord, with your quickening power that's in your bride, may you finish the portion of the work that you left to do in and through your bride. And may you do it now through me, Lord, through my brothers and sisters, by the quickening power, may you bring every spiritual reality to light in our flesh. May you have that great victory that you saw before the foundation of the world. When the final victory, death, is put under your feet when these bodies change, Lord. God, we ask that you would bless us as we go from here. As my family and I part and separate, Lord, it's always difficult for me to leave the assembly even for a vacation. But God, they're your sheep, not mine. These are your people, Lord, your children. God, and we trust you with each other as we take this little trip and come back together, Lord, We look forward to the trip, but we look forward to coming home and being united together again with the congregation. Pray that you bless us each and help us to grow, Lord, day by day, hour by hour, by the revelation and the knowledge that is in you. May your word, Lord, become more alive to us every moment of every day. May we look more like you every moment of every day. We ask these things in your keeping for us, Lord. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you, friends. Amen. Hear the cross, a trembling soul. Love and mercy found me. Yeah.
In spirit and in truth